A father kicked his son out for failure, but when he saw him on the cover of a magazine, he wept bitterly. The headline was dedicated to Parents never truly understand their children, and children rarely grasp their parents' struggles. Many authors have dedicated entire books to generational conflicts. As time passes, society changes rapidly, and people fail to adapt quickly enough. Children run away from home, parents argue over how to raise them, and families become divided. Norman had always faced minor challenges in life. He grew up in a single-parent household, cared for by his mother and grandmother. Despite all the love and care he received from the women in his life, he often felt misunderstood. After all, certain boyish problems are difficult for women to understand. His mother couldn't cope with Norman's rebellious streak, skipping classes, and getting into trouble. While she tried to keep him in line, his grandmother spoiled him. They oscillated between strictness and indulgence. But these small challenges made life colorful, and some left behind amusing memories. Norman Russell, his mother's piercing voice echoed through the house as the front door slammed shut. Principal Hall called. You haven't been to school for a week? Norman froze in the kitchen, mid-bite of a sandwich. His ears turned red instantly. He slowly turned his head, and his pleading gray eyes locked onto his grandmother. The old woman sat calmly in her favorite chair, knitting a lace doily. She glanced at her grandson and shrugged. Although she loved spoiling him, she took school very seriously. No way, young man. You're on your own with this one. Norman. That day, his mother gave him quite the lecture. Well, he deserved it. He didn't even try to deny it. Eventually, he became more responsible about school, at least during high school. He did well on his exams. Sure, he didn't get into a prestigious university, but let's be honest, not everyone can land a fully funded spot at a top institution. So, while Norman was disappointed at the time, he still did a great job. In the university where he enrolled, hoping to leave behind his dull high school years, Norman felt life gaining new momentum. He fell seriously in love for the first time. She was unlike any girl he had met before. Bright, confident, with a captivating smile and razor-sharp wit, Betty Wilson immediately caught his eye. Their relationship started with a casual conversation after one of the lectures, but it quickly blossomed into something more. Norman couldn't help but notice his heart race whenever he saw her. Betty was his complete opposite, bold, outgoing, and even a bit brash. Where Norman might have hesitated, Betty took the initiative. She was like a whirlwind that could bring excitement to any mundane situation, and Norman found that thrilling. However, their relationship wasn't easy from the start. His early attempts to court her didn't always go smoothly. Betty could suddenly throw out a sharp comment, leaving him feeling awkward. Hey, Betty. A young man called out to the girl walking down the hallway. Your hair looks nice. Did you style it differently today? Betty stopped, as did her friends around her. She glanced at Norman and scoffed. Oh, thanks, Betty smirked, her voice getting louder as she added, just don't break your neck when you try to check me out again, Russell. Norman chuckled under his breath, though tired of her snarky tone. Her friends giggled behind her, but he had had enough. And how exactly am I supposed to compliment you? Norman spread his arms in frustration. I'm trying to be nice, but all you do is snap back. Can't you just say thanks for once? Do you always have to be so sharp? Betty's smile faded. She furrowed her brows and clicked her tongue in disapproval. Well, excuse me, your highness, she shot back. Learn how to talk to women, will you? Their arguments were always followed by fiery makeups, and quiet moments would suddenly erupt in laughter, with jokes only they could understand. Yes, Betty could easily get offended by a couple of poorly chosen words, but the good thing was, she cooled down quickly. She also knew when she had gone too far with her own humor. Over time, Norman realized that this wasn't just a passing crush. He needed a woman like her, sharp-tongued, strong-willed, ready to stand her ground and challenge him. She was the spark that lit a fire in his heart, 
and he couldn't imagine being with anyone who didn't share her passionate nature. As their relationship grew deeper, he came to understand that she was the one he wanted to spend his life with. Life with Betty would never be easy, but that's exactly what he wanted. After graduating from university, Norman stood at the edge of adulthood, where everything seemed both intimidating and thrilling. He chose to become a dentist, deciding it was a stable and respected profession that would provide a comfortable life for him and his future family. With a diploma in hand and internship experience under his belt, his path seemed secure and predictable. In fact, it didn't take him long to find a job. One of the private medical centers offered him a position as a dentist. Norman quickly settled into his new role, his calm, focused demeanor, attention to detail, and, above all, his patients caught the attention of his supervisors. He was respected among his colleagues, though he never sought the spotlight, quiet and dependable, someone everyone could count on. The pay was solid, especially compared to those who had chosen less in-demand careers. While the work could be exhausting, it gave him what he valued most, stability and confidence in the future. The home he returned to after long work days became his fortress. There, his beloved wife, despite her fiery personality, had created a cozy and warm place that he longed to come back to time and time again. Simplicity, peace, and predictability became the foundation of their shared happiness. Their relationship gradually transformed from the fiery passions of youth into a warm and steady bond. Soon, an event turned their peaceful, measured life upside down, but also brought immense joy and pride, the birth of their son. This moment marked a new, much more significant chapter in Norman's life. The little boy, named Elliot, looked just like his father from the moment he was born. Even the doctors, upon seeing the newborn, commented on the striking resemblance, the same lips, facial features, and even ears, as if they were molded from the same template. Look at that, the midwife exclaimed with delight, turning the baby to show her colleagues. A perfect copy. It's amazing how genetics work out. Betty, exhausted and covered in sweat, smiled blissfully. Her baby was moving, breathing, and fussing. Norman's arms rested on her shoulders as he stood behind her, tears in his eyes, gazing intently at their son. We're a family now, Norm, she whispered softly, a complete family, sweetheart. The first months and years of parenthood flew by in a whirlwind of tasks and responsibilities. Nighttime wake-ups, diapers, first steps, it was all new and exciting for both parents. Despite the challenges, Norman felt an incredible sense of fulfillment watching his son grow. For the first time, he began to understand what it meant to be a father and the immense responsibility that came with that role. As Elliot grew older, it became more evident that he had inherited not only his father's looks, but also his temperament. Calm, composed, and methodical, he embodied the very traits Norman always considered his own strengths. If something went wrong, Elliot rarely got upset or frustrated, preferring to solve problems in a measured, patient way, just like his father. The next big milestone was starting first grade. Betty and Norman were both terribly anxious, but Elliot remained unfazed. Mom, it's going to be fine, the six-year-old boy said with surprising maturity. I'm smart. It won't be hard for me. Betty nervously adjusted her son's vest. She kept fussing with his light hair over and over, even though it wasn't clear what she thought was untidy about his hairstyle. Sweetheart, I know. You're a very clever boy. But it's your first day of school, she said, kneeling down and kissing Elliot on the forehead. And I'm your mom. It's my job to worry. Can you take the day off? Norman, standing beside them, chuckled. Even though Elliot had inherited much of his father's personality, subtle traces of Betty could be seen in him, small, almost invisible, but they were there. Looking at his son, Norman remembered his own school days. No, Elliot's experience would be much better than his had been. Well, buddy, Norman said as he tousled Elliot's hair, it's time to go. There's so much waiting for you, pal, time to head out. In class, Elliot was neither a leader nor an outsider. He found a few good friends and was well respected for his ability to listen and understand, displaying a maturity beyond his years. 
Unlike most children, who sometimes lost patience or struggled to focus on one task for long, Elliot showed a rare composure and determination for someone his age. Seven years after the birth of their first son, another joyous yet challenging moment arrived, the birth of their second boy. This time, the joy of parenthood came with growing concerns, as from the very beginning, Andrew was nothing like his older brother. From that moment, the real challenge began for the parents who had grown used to calm and predictability. Late one night, Betty nudged her husband with her elbow. The baby's cries echoed through the house, audible through the slightly open door. They could hear Elliot trudging toward the kitchen, clearly awakened as well. Norman stubbornly refused to open his eyes, trying to save her a few more moments in bed. Sometimes Betty thought he was pretending to be dead, anything to avoid getting up. Norm, get up, she muttered hoarsely. It's your turn. I went to him last time. Norman shivered and pulled the blanket over his head, barely aware of whether he was awake or still dreaming. He had been jumping up in the middle of the night so often that he lost track of time. Betty, I have work in the morning, the dentist tried to argue. And I have to drive Elliot to school. Suddenly, the crying grew louder, moving closer to them. Norman turned on the bedside lamp, and he and Betty squinted down the dark hallway. Elliot appeared in the doorway, carrying baby Andrew in his arms, looking just as utterly exhausted as his parents. The boy walked up to his mother and gently placed the wriggling, red-faced, tear-streaked baby on her stomach. He's hungry, Elliot sniffled and wiped his nose on the sleeve of his orange pajamas. Can I sleep at Sam's tomorrow? Looking at her eldest, Betty sighed sympathetically. Yes, she and Norman had wanted another child, but now it wasn't just them who were struggling, Elliot was suffering too. He never complained or threw a fit, but she could see the growing frustration in him every time the baby cried. Children Elliot's age needed their sleep to grow up healthy, and he wasn't getting enough rest. Yes. Yes, of course, sweetie, she glanced briefly at her husband, who nodded in agreement. Remind your dad tomorrow so he can take you. But for now, please, try to get some sleep. If their older son was calm, quiet, and easy to raise, their younger one was his polar opposite. From birth, Eddie made his presence known with loud cries and constant fussiness. As the years passed, Eddie's personality became more distinct. He grew into an active, energetic, and restless child, always on the move and constantly seeking new experiences. His loud laughter and equally loud tears became a regular part of the household soundtrack. While Elliot preferred quiet activities and playing alone, Eddie couldn't sit still for even a minute. He loved attention, frequently testing boundaries and pushing his parents' patience to the limit. Over time, it became clear that Eddie had inherited his mother's personality. His assertiveness and stubbornness, combined with childlike impulsiveness, often led to unpredictable situations. The house was now filled with lively arguments as the youngest son insisted on asserting his opinions, demanding special attention. But that was only the beginning. While the older son brought home certificates of praise and delighted his parents with academic success, the younger son turned school into a veritable playground for his pranks. If the older boy was a model student, a pride and joy for the teachers, the younger one seemed to do everything possible to drive them to the brink of a nervous breakdown. His name quickly became well known in the teacher's lounge, and no meeting went by without mentioning his antics. And, interestingly enough, in elementary school, he still showed interest in learning. He had a competitive spirit and a natural curiosity. The problems at school began almost immediately after he transitioned to middle school, and from that moment on, it was as if he had been replaced. One of his teachers, Mr. Griffith, a strict man who didn't tolerate any liberties, clearly didn't like him. As a teenager, Andrew couldn't understand why he was constantly singled out from his peers and subjected to criticism. He distinctly remembered a moment from middle school. He called that day the beginning of the era of laughter. His classmate, Ronnie, had turned to him to ask something. I don't know, Andrew replied to a question he no longer remembered. Ask Sarah, she's the class nerd. There was a loud smack, the sound Mr. Griffith made when he started his angry rants. 
It was the sound of a ruler hitting the teacher's desk. The man stood up from his chair and cast an unfriendly gaze over the class. His eyes landed on Andrew, and the boy immediately knew he had done something wrong. Mr. Russell, do you think you're behaving properly right now? The teacher said slowly, enunciating each word. Andrew shifted in his seat. What had he done? Had he been rude to Sarah? But that was just how they talked. They were friends. Andrew was genuinely confused. Mr. Griffith, I don't quite understand what I did wrong. Oh, you don't understand, the man said, walking briskly toward Andrew. You are disrupting the discipline in the classroom, chatting about whatever you like while the teacher is trying to hammer knowledge into your careless head. Do you think you've done nothing wrong, Mr. Russell? Ronnie, who had been the one to start the conversation, turned around, equally puzzled as to why the teacher was attacking Andrew. Sir, but I was the one who spoke to him first. The man curled his lip in contempt. He barely glanced at the blonde boy, choosing instead to focus on the one who had caught his ire. Raising his long wooden ruler, he struck the desk again. I didn't ask. I saw how Mr. Russell showed blatant disrespect for the educational process, not you. The man turned back toward his desk, but if you feel so inclined, Mr. Phillips, you can join your friend. Both of you will stay after class. The boys exchanged glances. Somewhere from the depths of the classroom came a wave of stifled laughter. Ronnie bit his lip. Andrew knew that look, his friend was angry, really angry. But there was nothing they could do. Andrew pushed his tousled russet hair back and dropped his head onto his folded arms on the desk. And it wasn't the last time Mr. Griffith soured their mood. Every mistake, every tardiness, every unfinished assignment turned into a small battle where Andrew, despite all his efforts, always ended up losing. But what grows within a child when he feels powerless to defend himself? A desire to rebel. Misbehavior, skipping classes, and shirking school responsibilities became his way of expressing protest against what he felt was unfair treatment. His mom and dad tried to steer him back on the right path, but every conversation about school or his future only irritated him further. He didn't want to listen, convinced that they couldn't possibly understand his feelings and struggles. His urge to misbehave and skip school became a personal rebellion against a system that, in his eyes, was set against him. His mother, noticing the changes in his behavior, tried to reconnect with him, but her constant exhaustion and stress from work made it hard for her to find the right approach. His grandmother, on the other hand, believed that strict discipline and punishment would fix the situation, which led to frequent conflicts within the family. Andrew, Principal Dockery called again. Betty quietly slipped into her son's room like a little mouse. This can't go on. You've only been to school 12 times this month. Do you even understand what you're doing? The boy let out an exaggerated, theatrical sigh. He tore his eyes away from the video game and turned to face his mother. In the chaos of the teenager's room, she looked almost endearingly neat. She wore a pink house dress, fluffy slippers, and a silly headband she used to keep her hair dry when washing her face. Behind her, the dark green wallpaper framed the unmade bed, a heap of dirty clothes in the corner, random scraps of paper scattered about, and a bright red skateboard leaning against the wall. Mom, I've told you a hundred times, I don't want to be there, the boy began immediately, pushing his point. That Griffith used to just make my life miserable during class, but now he's on my case in the hallways too. Seriously, whenever he sees me, he has to find something to complain about. That old jerk. Andrew, I'm serious. Watch your language. This isn't okay. You can't skip school just because one teacher won't let you act out. She planted her hands on her hips and frowned. You've got exams coming up, and you need to think about college or university. I know you. And I know you don't like sitting still. But enough with the way you're talking about Mr. Griffith. He's just a jerk. Andrew snapped. Andrew. Betty scolded, her voice sharp. The boy jumped up from his chair, grabbed his backpack off the bed, and stormed past his mother. And of course, like any rebellious teenager, he didn't forget to slam the door behind him. 
the situation at school was growing more and more tense. His parents were being called in for meetings with the teachers and principal almost every week. Every conversation sounded the same. The youngest son was disrupting classes, arguing with teachers, and his sharp tongue turned ordinary lessons into a trial for the staff. The teachers were at their wit's end, unsure how to rein in his constant antics and tactless comments, which regularly threw them off balance. Betty and Norman sat once again in the uncomfortable office of the principal. Mr. Dockery remained silent for a long time. Even he was growing uncomfortable with these meetings. He knew he was summoning them too frequently, but he couldn't ignore what was happening. Well, Mr. and Mrs. Russell, the principal began cautiously, pressing his index fingers against his lips, Andrew. The parents shifted uneasily, feeling that unpleasant churn inside them. Their ears flushed red as if they were the ones back in school, giving their teachers headaches. The man in the office chair sighed heavily. Last week, he sprayed several cans of furniture polish all over the chalkboard in the math room. The board had to be replaced. We couldn't clean it off. And on the same week, he unscrewed the bolts from his classmates' chairs. But that wasn't enough. He also took out the bolts from the door hinges in three different classrooms. Principal Dockery pulled some strange device from his desk drawer. I have to give him credit. Those childhood construction sets weren't wasted on him. He built some kind of spray mechanism, attached it to Courtney, the cheerleader's locker. When she opened it, she got sprayed with water. And in that water, he added blue dye and a bunch of glitter. Courtney's still walking around blue and literally shining with beauty. Norman stifled a laugh. Betty gave him a sharp smack on the knee. She was flushed with anger and embarrassment. Anything else? She asked, though she wasn't entirely sure she wanted to hear the answer. The man raised his eyebrows, spreading his hands as he reached back into the drawer. Out came firecrackers, bottles of colored water, scorched office supplies, and finally, a paper bag, its contents already too obvious. Betty groaned in frustration and slid down in her chair. And that's not even counting his mid-class performances, Dockery said, locking eyes with Norman. He was even kicked out of the comedy club. He's worn everyone out. It's not professional for me to speak this way about a student, but I simply can't find other words. We all respect you deeply, Mr. Russell. You've often brought smiles to our staff, and your older son, Elliot, a golden boy, really. But Andrew, he's cut from a different cloth. We're seriously considering expulsion. No, this is going too far. Betty suddenly jumped up from her seat. The boy just wants attention. He hasn't hurt anyone, and we're paying for the damaged property. If you respect the older Russell so much, then you'll have to accept that Andrew likes to entertain people. Why don't you look at your football player, Gregory? What did he do to that boy named Ronnie? Why can Gregory stay and Andrew can't? Because Gregory's dad works at City Hall? Principal Dockery coughed abruptly. He stood up from his chair and approached the Russells. Norman also stood up and grabbed his wife by the shoulders, trying to calm her down. Dockery gently touched the backs of the couple and slowly guided them towards the office door. You know, Mrs. Russell, you're right, the man said quietly through his nervous coughing. He hasn't hurt anyone. Andrew is already in middle school, and there isn't much time left until he graduates. You know, it's actually more fun with him around. Best wishes, and thank you for coming. At home, they avoided discussing the conversation. They didn't want to think about the fact that their son was on the verge of expulsion. He was that uncontrollable. Norman often thought about what kind of grades his younger son would end up with when he finished school. He imagined the document with grades, and it made him uneasy. The man feared that his Andrew might end up on the sidelines of life. And the more he thought about it, the more his despair grew. He tried talking to his son about the importance of education, about how good grades could open many doors. He told him stories from his youth about how hard it was for him without a father, how he worked hard to succeed. But all these conversations hit a wall of teenage cynicism. The boy listened, but it seemed the words never truly reached him. He shrugged, dismissed the advice, or worse, joked about it. 
I'll run off with some traveling circus, Dad, Andrew laughed in response. Clowns are always needed. I won't disappear. Norman understood that time was ticking, and if nothing was done, the moment when something could be changed would be lost forever. Andrew, come back to reality. Your mom and I won't be around for the rest of your life. Norman rubbed his nose. You need to think about the future. At least a little. Or are you waiting for me to lock you in the house with a stack of textbooks? The boy scoffed. Everything around him seemed like a big game. He genuinely didn't understand why he should make an effort for grades. Andrew knew the material. He just couldn't be bothered to answer, write, or explain. It was a shame his father didn't understand that. Dad, just chill. I don't want to talk anymore. Meanwhile, Norman increasingly resorted to punishment, hoping it would make his son reconsider his behavior and get his act together. He restricted Andrew's access to entertainment, punished him for poor grades and constant complaints from teachers, and tried to establish strict rules and order in the house. But these measures, it seemed, didn't yield the desired results. Andrew continued to behave as if he had no intention of focusing seriously. What's more, due to the new system of punishment, the couple began to argue frequently. They simply had different views on how to handle the situation. Oh, God, Norman. Betty lamented, throwing a towel onto the table. He's just a teenager. Stop putting so much pressure on him. There was a long silence. Norman sat in his chair, his jaw tightly clenched. He was still recalling the times when Elliot was the same age as Andrew now. The only problems the older son had were a desire to control everything around him, questions about the family budget, an obsession with cleanliness, and satiable curiosity. The boy was a perfectionist. Elliot didn't need any pressure, Beth. And Eddie doesn't even budge with a kick, he said gruffly and wearily, his voice becoming even more hoarse as he continued, Do you like the thought of our youngest son not getting a proper education? That he won't get a decent job? Do you want to see him become a nobody? Betty clutched her head, digging her fingers into her thick black hair. She was angry, and it was obvious. Why do you always compare them? Just imagine how he feels. Living in the shadow of his father and older brother, and everyone around him tells him he's worthless, she said, suddenly sniffing, but her face didn't change. For once, say something nice to him. How can you be so heartless? Suddenly, there was a loud crash. Norman slammed his hands on the table. Why should I praise him, he roared. For driving teachers to hysterics? Maybe for laughing at any attempt to teach him something useful? Betty froze. She looked at her husband with undisguised disappointment. All she could do was turn and head for the kitchen door, dropping one last comment. You're just incorrigible. Even though both parents wanted the same thing, to see their sons succeed in life and be happy, they couldn't find a compromise. There was no need to worry about Elliot. He was an exemplary student, calm and composed, which only highlighted the contrast with his younger brother. The older son was a source of pride for his parents, and his future seemed predictable and bright. But Andrew, with his reckless behavior and penchant for mischief, was a constant source of anxiety and disagreement. When the younger son entered high school, his parents hoped he would finally start showing some seriousness and responsibility. They were prepared for the challenges of adolescence, but no one expected what happened one evening. That day, they all gathered for dinner. Even Elliot came home from college. Nothing seemed out of place until the younger son calmly announced his plans for the future. It seemed like an ordinary teenage statement, but it turned out to be a bombshell that shattered their established world. Mom, Dad, I've been thinking a bit about my career, work, all that, Eddie said, pausing to take a sip of juice. I want to be an entertainer. Norman froze, holding his fork midair. He didn't immediately grasp what his son meant. He had been expecting the boy to finally start talking about college plans, a career choice that would provide stability and confidence for the future. But what he heard was so far from his expectations that he could barely contain his anger. Andrew, the name of the young man, thundered through the kitchen. Norman? 
Betty forced a tight smile, knowing another scene was about to unfold. How's the fish? Did I overcook it? But Norman didn't hear her. He stared at Andrew with an unblinking gaze. The boy continued eating as if nothing had happened. He had grown accustomed to his father's disapproval, and he was no longer even angry about it. After a minute of awkward silence, the man spoke. Have you completely lost your mind? Norman threw his fork onto his plate and crossed his arms over his chest. An entertainer? As if that's what your mother and I needed, son. Andrew shrugged. He braced himself for whatever his father was about to unleash. He didn't really care much about what was going to be said. Do you even know how many jokers there are like you in this country? Hundreds. Thousands, Andy. And each one thinks they're good enough to be that lucky guy with a microphone in hand. The man spoke with slightly more calm than at the beginning of the conversation. It's nonsense. Just a dead end. Well, my whole life feels like a show. I'm always in the spotlight, not afraid to talk to people, and mom says I'm good looking. The boy grinned in his trademark manner. I think I've got a shot. Betty sat with her hand pressed to her forehead. She didn't like where this conversation was headed. The evening was supposed to be quiet and peaceful. Even Elliot had found time to gather the family like this. And now her husband was in a rage, and the youngest son refused to keep his mouth shut. She could see Norman's ears turning red. An explosion was imminent. What the hell is wrong with you? The man erupted, jumping out of his seat and pacing nervously. We've given you everything. Do you understand? Everything. We pay for the consequences of your antics. We pay for tutors. Andy, we don't even punish you for your stupid jokes anymore. We just sit and pray that you'll get your act together. How could you be so? Norman, enough. Throughout this, Elliot had been watching with mixed feelings. On one hand, he was grown up enough to understand why their parents reacted so strongly to his younger brother's decision. On the other hand, he saw that Andrew simply didn't want to follow in their footsteps, that he needed his own path, however risky it might be. But his voice, even if he had decided to intervene, would have been drowned out by the noise of arguments and accusations. Enjoy your meal, clown. And you too, loser. Thus began a new chapter in the family's life, full of conflicts and mutual misunderstanding. Every evening turned into yet another argument about the future of the youngest son, and no one knew how it would all end. For Andrew, the home that was once his sanctuary had become a place of stifling atmosphere. Upon returning from school, he was no longer greeted with warm words as before. Instead, he was met with cold silence and downcast eyes. The boy felt that every step he took, every word he spoke, was now under a microscope, as if everyone was waiting for him to make another mistake. Despite the constant quarrels and his father's prohibitions, Andy did not abandon his dream. He continued to attend courses and workshops where he learned the art of performance, honing his skills despite his parents' disapproval. For him, these activities were not just an escape from his problems, but a real breath of fresh air. In these small groups and clubs, he found the understanding and support that was so lacking at home. Here, away from parental control and expectations, he could be himself, an energetic, witty, somewhat cheeky teenager who enjoyed joking and acting silly. Especially important to him were his performances in stand-up shows, which were sometimes held in small local bars. On those stages, even before a small audience, he felt alive and genuine. Each time he stepped onto the stage, he felt as if he was shedding the burden of expectations and criticism as his jokes resonated with the audience, even if they were strangers. But Norman didn't give up. It had become a matter of principle. Due to the constant arguments, he and Betty were on the brink of divorce, but this was the least of his concerns. His son would get a proper job. End of story. Whether he wanted it or not, Norman didn't care. He wouldn't allow Andy to end up with nothing after his dream led him to failure. Do you remember about the exams? Oh, not again. Norman opened the door to his son's room wider. In his right hand, he held three books. It was clear to everyone that these were textbooks. 
Get away from your games, he said, approaching the desk and placing the stack of books on it. A couple of hours a day won't drain you. The man was so consumed by his desire to provide his son with a decent life that he had even chosen a career path for him, becoming a surveyor. He had pondered what profession to suggest to Andy that would match his abilities while guaranteeing a good income and stability. Geography was one of the few subjects the boy managed to handle. It didn't evoke the same revulsion as many other school subjects, and that alone seemed sufficient for his father's choice. Norman convinced himself that the profession of a surveyor was the perfect compromise. It offered a stable income that could ensure his son a decent life. Additionally, as it seemed to the father, the profession had an element of freedom that could satisfy his son's desire for independence. Working in the field, in different parts of the country, he could use his skills while having free time to do what he enjoyed without risking his career or tarnishing the family name. However, for the boy, the situation was entirely different. He felt that his father was imposing his unsolicited opinions on him. Surveying, while not repugnant to Andy, still didn't ignite any passion or interest. It was just another pile of information he learned because it was required, not because it fascinated him. With each passing day, the pressure from his father became more palpable. Every conversation about school, every new exam preparation schedule only intensified his despair. Andrew felt cornered with no way out. He saw his father stubbornly building plans for his future without considering his own dreams and interests. And the boy couldn't influence it. On that crucial day when one of the decisive school exams was to take place, Norman woke up with a heavy heart. He knew today was not just an ordinary day, but an opportunity for his son to take a step toward a secure and stable future. Norman planned to take his son to school himself to ensure he arrived on time and didn't forget anything. He understood how important this moment was and hoped that his Andrew would finally grasp the seriousness of the situation. Andy, are you ready? We need to leave, Norman said flatly. I still have to make it to work, so. The room was empty. The notebooks were in place. Even the boy's backpack was still in its usual spot under the computer chair. Beth? Betty, the man called out toward the hallway. Where's Andrew? He's in his room, dear, the woman responded casually. No, he's not in his room. Oh God, Betty, the exam. In a panic, Norman started calling his older son and even the teachers, trying to find out if anyone knew where Andrew might be. No one had any answers. The father felt a surge of fear and anger rising within him. He understood that time was running out, and if they didn't find the boy now, he would miss the exam, which could be crucial for his future education. Oh God, Andy, what are you doing? Norman lamented, nervously wandering around the house with his phone in hand. Time dragged unbearably slowly. The hours passed, the exam had already started, and hope that his son would still show up and take it faded with each minute. Norman, who usually tried to keep his composure, was now completely off balance. He felt his world crumbling, losing control over the situation and his child. It was only later in the evening, when the search had begun to seem futile, that his son finally appeared. He came home calmly, as if nothing unusual had happened. Seeing him, his father couldn't contain either his anger or disappointment. He immediately lashed out at the boy with shouts and questions, demanding explanations. The man was so worked up that he could barely find the words to express the full range of emotions he was feeling. The exam? Andrew genuinely looked surprised. Oh, the exam. I just forgot it was today. An ominous silence hung in the living room. Even Betty was not on the boy's side this time. Her eyes widened, and in her outrage, she started moving her mouth like a fish out of water. Andy, how could you do this? Well, I was invited to host an event at a restaurant. The same one where you and Dad celebrated your anniversary, the boy smiled and adjusted his bangs. I thought it would be beneficial for me, so I spent a lot of time preparing for that evening. I guess I just forgot about the exam. The situation escalated to the breaking point. The father felt this was more than just teenage rebellion. It was a fundamental disagreement that could destroy their relationship. 
He couldn't understand how his son could choose an event he considered trivial over an education that should have been the cornerstone of his life. Just perfect, son. Absolutely perfect, Norman hissed through gritted teeth. He couldn't accept that the boy had taken his education so lightly, neglected the exam, and jeopardized everything Norman considered important. In his eyes, the son had just wiped out his future for an insignificant activity that wouldn't bring him money or respect in society. The man was determined to put his son back on the right path. You're going straight to your room. No going out, no phone, no computer. Nowhere, Andy, nowhere. Norman's eyes were fixed on Andrew, and his gaze was filled with anger. You'll study. And you'll leave the house only for extra classes. You have no more freedom of movement or choice. You'll pass this exam, and you'll get into college. Andrew frowned in confusion. To him, the situation didn't seem that serious. So what if you missed an exam? He leaned against the doorframe and shrugged his shoulders. Why suddenly? I was invited to perform in the neighboring town. I'm doing great, the boy said with a touch of hurt, and now you want to lock me up. Did I kill someone or rob a bank? You're killing your future right now. Norman stood up from the couch, quickly approached his son, and grabbed him by the collar, and I won't let you do that. Surprisingly, the son agreed to his father's terms. He didn't argue or conflict, but accepted the decision as a given. For Norman, this was a sign that the boy had finally realized his mistake and was ready to rectify the situation. During the preparation period for the retake, the son diligently attended classes, and the father began to hope that their relationship crisis would be overcome. However, the son didn't specify which exact classes he was attending. The father saw that the boy returned home late, clearly exhausted, and took this as a sign that he was seriously preparing for the exam. The father began to believe that his harsh measures had worked and that Andy had finally accepted his point of view. But the day before the rescheduled exam, Andrew approached his father with a flyer. It listed the date and location of the show, and not just any show, he had been selected as the host. It turned out that all this time, Andrew had not been preparing for the exam at all, but had been attending auditions and meetings with managers. His persistence and determination had paid off, and now he had his first significant opportunity, a chance to host a major event. The father was horrified and enraged. He felt deceived and betrayed by his own son. All his plans for the rescheduled exam and further education crumbled in an instant. As soon as he realized that his son had secretly been preparing not for the exam but for another performance, his anger and disappointment reached a peak. How much longer? Andy, this is just unbearable. Dad, just listen to me already. Andy raised his voice for the first time in years. If I perform well, I'll be able to break through. I'll become a showman. Everything will be fine. I'll have money. I'll be famous. Give me a chance. For the father, these words were like a knife to the heart. He couldn't believe that his son seriously thought this dream could replace a real education and profession. But the boy continued to insist, speaking with such enthusiasm and confidence that Norman momentarily wondered if there was some sense in it. Andy convinced him that this show was his chance for a successful life, that he would do everything possible to live up to expectations and achieve success. The father faced a choice that questioned all his principles and views on life. He had to either let his son go and allow him to follow his own path or insist on his own way and risk losing his son's trust and their relationship forever. Although with great skepticism, he agreed to attend the show. He decided that it would be the last chance to prove that his passion for show business could lead to something meaningful. If you value these fairy tales so much, here's a dose of reality. If you fail, no one will be waiting for you at home. Andy nodded. He was confident he could handle it. The day of the show arrived, and the tension was palpable from the morning. The makeup artists fell ill, causing confusion with the participants' preparations. The lighting technician reported that the main spotlight was broken, which meant the stage lighting wouldn't be as planned. Everyone involved in the show was scrambling to address the issues. The atmosphere was heating up, and every minute's delay worsened the situation. 
but despite the chaos around him, Andy tried to remain upbeat and confident. When the show began, the tension in the hall did not dissipate. Although the stage was set and the audience had gathered, everyone could feel that something was wrong. Guests and extras, who were supposed to follow a strict script, began deviating from it due to the earlier confusion. The meticulously prepared script now seemed useless. The situation was spiraling out of control, and despite all his efforts, the young showman couldn't keep everything together. He tried to improvise and work around the difficult situations, but the audience's response was tepid. Jokes that might have landed well in another scenario now seemed forced and out of place. The audience was clearly bored, evident from the faces of those seated in the hall. Instead of laughter and applause, there was an air of silence and disappointment. The atmosphere became increasingly oppressive, and gradually, people started leaving the hall. The spectators who had come with expectations of fun and entertainment now rose from their seats in disappointment and quietly departed. Norman, sitting at the back of the hall, watched the unfolding scene with a heavy heart. He saw his son, who had believed so fervently in this show, slowly descending into failure. It was a painful sight to witness all the boy's efforts unraveling before his eyes. When there were almost no spectators left in the hall, Norman decided it was time to end it. The show was over. Approaching the stage, he looked straight into his son's eyes, which no longer held the confidence and enthusiasm they had in the morning. The father could not contain the bitterness and disappointment that had accumulated over the months. He approached his son and, casting a brief glance at the emptying hall, said in a cold tone, I hope it was worth your future. These words were filled with reproach and bitterness, like a verdict summarizing everything that had happened. Dad, I... But he turned and left, melting into the crowd leaving the hall. Andrew, standing on the stage, felt the world around him collapse. He had imagined this evening as his triumph, his first step toward success. But instead, he faced a failure that was hard to bear. At that moment, he realized he had disappointed not only his audience, but also his father, who had expected so much from him. After his father bitterly left the hall, leaving his son alone with his failure, Andrew remained on stage, feeling the growing despair and emptiness inside him. His dreams, which had seemed so close to realization, were now crumbling before his eyes. He watched as the audience continued to leave, heard the muted footsteps of departing people, and understood that this evening, which should have been his first big success, had turned into a disaster. When the stage was empty, the casting managers approached him, the very people who had once given him a chance. They looked tense and focused, clearly aware of how uncomfortable the forthcoming conversation would be. One of them, apparently the leader, handed him an envelope with payment for the performance, but at that moment, money seemed insignificant to him. What's next? The casting managers, seemingly anticipating his thoughts, began to explain the situation. Their words were careful but cold, as if they were trying to conclude the conversation as quickly as possible without delving into unnecessary details. You have to understand that in show business, things don't always go as planned. One of them began, today was a tough day, and not everything went as we would have liked. We see that you tried, but... They exchanged glances, and an awkward silence hung in the air. But there was a fairly important person in the audience today, continued another manager, his voice tinged with tension. The young man immediately understood that this was about a powerful critic or producer, someone whose opinion could make or break careers in the industry. This was the kind of person whose approval or disapproval could determine the future of anyone trying to make it on stage. We couldn't afford the risk, added the first manager, lowering his gaze. When things go wrong, it's always easier and safer to blame the newcomer. It's not very smart to admit that the problem might be with us. These words sounded like a sentence. The young man felt his heart contract. He understood that they were essentially saying, we're blaming you for the show's failure. Although it wasn't stated outright, that was the essence of it. The managers apologized, but their apologies felt formal, lacking genuine sympathy. Nothing personal, said one of them, placing his hefty hand on Andy's shoulder. It's just business. You understand, we needed to explain why things went wrong. 
It's easiest to do that by blaming a newcomer, especially when the reputation of the entire team is at stake. The young man stood silently, clutching the envelope with money, which now seemed like a symbol of his failure. His heart was filled with bitterness. He realized he had been used as a convenient scapegoat to cover up the team's mistakes and shortcomings. All his confidence, all the hopes he had invested in the show, had now turned to dust. You knew what you were getting into, added the manager, as if trying to teach him a lesson, but this lesson was bitter and painful. Next time, if there is one, you'll be smarter and more cautious. In this business, you need to be not only talented, but also shrewd. Today, you learned that. With these words, the managers turned and left, leaving him alone on the empty stage where his first real defeat had just occurred. The young man stood in the empty hall, feeling his dreams and ambitions starting to crumble. It seemed to him that the world he had so wanted to conquer had suddenly shut its doors, not even giving him a chance for a real test. He had been let down by the team he had considered his allies. His father, disillusioned by the failure, had effectively renounced him, leaving him with bitter words that echoed in his mind. I hope it was worth your future. Now he understood that he could no longer count on his parents' support. The future, which once seemed bright and full of opportunities, now felt empty. He felt he had lost the chance to escape mediocrity and pursue his passion. Admission to university no longer seemed possible. Having failed the exams, he had disappointed everyone who had believed in him. Ahead lay a gray life with jobs devoid of joy and meaning. He imagined himself as a cashier or a gas station attendant, and this thought gnawed at him. He knew his situation was temporary. Andy lived with his high school friend, Ronnie. While staying there, he did small chores around the house, feeling like a free maid. Although it didn't humiliate him, pride told him that he couldn't rely on others' kindness for long and needed to manage on his own. In an effort to start over and climb out of the rut he was in, the young man got a job at a local supermarket. Working as a store clerk wasn't the job he had dreamed of, but it was something. He knew he needed to begin somewhere to regain control over his life. Every day he went to work, trying not to think about how far he had drifted from his dreams. The job was monotonous and exhausting. Sorting products, stocking shelves, helping customers, all of it seemed so far removed from the grand plans he had once harbored. The only thing that kept him going was his promise to himself and his friend that he would move out as soon as he received his first paycheck. On a day that seemed as ordinary and gray as all the others, the young man was working his shift at the supermarket. He carried out his duties almost automatically, lost in thoughts about how he once dreamed of a completely different life. When a man in a shirt approached him, the young man turned with a habitual smile, ready to help find the item the customer needed. The stranger looked vaguely familiar, but the young man didn't think much of it. The stranger suddenly perked up when he took a closer look at him. At first, the young man couldn't understand what was happening, but then the man, with a smile on his face, said, I saw your show. These words caught the young man off guard. The show that had failed in front of his father and the entire audience seemed to him like a distant, almost forgotten nightmare that he wished he could erase from his memory. His heart tightened, and he instinctively hunched his shoulders, bracing for mockery or criticism. The man, seemingly oblivious to the young man's discomfort, continued speaking. Oh, that show was a real flop. Such dreary guests, and the extras were wooden, the stranger chuckled. And people paid to see that. But then something unexpected happened. The man suddenly fell silent, then took a step closer and placed his hand on the young man's shoulder. It was an unexpected but sincere gesture that conveyed support and understanding. But you know, many of my acquaintances noted that you fought for the show until the very end, he said. You literally radiated energy, trying to save what already seemed hopeless. The young man, who until that moment had been unable to lift his eyes from the ground out of shame and disappointment, suddenly felt something change inside him. He slowly raised his gaze to the stranger, his eyes shining with a mix of surprise and hope. These words, so unexpected and filled with support, rekindled a spark within him that he thought he had lost forever. 
For the first time in a long while, he felt that his efforts had not been in vain, that someone had noticed and appreciated his hard work. The young man opened his mouth to thank the stranger, but the words caught in his throat. He didn't know how to express his gratitude for this unexpected ray of light in his seemingly hopeless situation. However, the stranger didn't give him time to think. He simply pulled a business card from his pocket and handed it to the young man. Brian Morris. Here's my number, he said with a smile. Call me when you're ready. I want to give you another chance. This time, with a better prepared team. Th. Thank you, sir. You can't imagine how much it means to hear those words. Andrew stood, stunned, holding the business card as if it were a ticket to a new life. He could hardly believe his luck. The very important person who had been behind his sabotage at the ill-fated show turned out not just to be a spectator, but a renowned comedian who had started his own talk show. And now this person was offering him a second chance, a chance to try again, but this time with a team of professionals who could support and guide him. In the days that followed, after returning home from his shift at the supermarket, Andrew would immediately head to his small mirror in his room. Now, his heart burned not just with hope, but with a flame fueled by the realization that fate had given him a second chance. He went to rehearsals several times a week. He knew that this opportunity might be his last, and he wasn't going to let it slip away. When the filming day arrived, Andrew could barely contain the surge of excitement that swept over him. The first minutes of the shoot felt like an eternity. He stood on stage, surrounded by cameras and bright lights, unable to find his footing amid the anxiety. His hands were sweating uncontrollably, and his mouth was dry. Everything he had practiced so carefully seemed to evaporate from his mind, leaving only a void and the fear of failure. But then something happened that changed everything. During the conversation, the guest, known for her sharp judgments and biting wit, made a blunder. She said something so evidently foolish that it could easily be used against her. You know, the woman said confidently, lifting her chin, success is the result of willpower. If people just complained less and worked more, everyone would live like me. Andrew in the corner tensed. Her voice sounded so self-assured that his hands clenched into fists under the table. But then she made the very mistake he was waiting for. After all, she continued, I wake up at 5 in the morning every day and look at the result, a perfect figure, a successful business, and five cats that I walk in the mornings. At that moment, something clicked in Andrew's mind. A spark. The spark he needed. Wait a minute, he interrupted with exaggerated seriousness, you walk cats? At 5 in the morning? The room suddenly fell silent, anticipating the climax. The woman looked at him in bewilderment. Well, yes, she replied, narrowing her eyes. What's the problem? You know, cats usually walk us, he remarked. They just let you think you're in charge. They must be training you for a possible uprising. The woman blinked, unsure how to respond, but the audience had already started laughing. Ah, so that's what those sly looks were about, she smirked, trying to regain control. But no, I'm just demonstrating my leadership. Leadership over cats? Andrew raised an eyebrow. Well, that's next level boss. Now you just need to teach them to make coffee, and they'll serve you forever. The room erupted in laughter, and as the woman realized she was being outplayed, she attempted a comeback. You know, Andrew, you have discipline issues. Maybe you should try waking up earlier too? The young man smirked, suddenly feeling like he was in his element. Of course. I actually tried waking up at 5 in the morning. Only my main discipline at that time is not falling back into bed. The audience roared with laughter, and the woman, losing her grasp on the conversation, tried to retort. Well, maybe you're not as strong as you think. Or maybe the cats just want me to think that. Andrew shot back, waving his hand. You're experienced, so tell me, are they already trying to take over the world? Or just starting small, dominating the backyard? The crowd was in hysterics, and Andrew, feeling the confidence that had once been his best friend, realized he was back in the game. 
The words he had spoken seemed to have stirred up a hornet's nest. They sparked a genuine storm of emotions, enlivened the studio atmosphere, and earned him newfound respect from everyone present. He understood this was the moment that could change everything. He knew he could handle it, keep the audience engaged, make them laugh and react. He was finally tasting the success he had been searching for. Each laugh, each wave of giggles from the audience seemed to infuse him with vitality, bolstering his confidence and lifting his spirits. He felt that spark igniting within him, the one that true hosts possess. He began to understand that with each successful quip, he was gaining control over the room, the situation, everything around him. This was his show, his moment, and he was ready to seize it fully. He instinctively grasped that a host's success relied not only on the ability to joke, but also on the skill of timing. He waited for the right moments, skillfully noting the slightest flaws in the guest's words, making jabs, but never overdoing it. He knew that too many jokes could lose their edge, and constantly teasing a guest could erode their trust and interest. Balance became his primary weapon. After each successful comment, he paused, giving the audience and guests time to absorb what was said before launching into his next witty remark. The entire room was captivated by his performance, the audience reacting to every word, every gesture, which gave him even more confidence. The young man finally realized that all his efforts, all the previous failures and difficulties, had led him to this moment. When the show concluded and he returned to the dressing room, he was greeted with loud applause. It was a moment of true recognition. People who had seen countless hosts and participated in numerous shows now looked at him with respect and admiration. He was the hero of the evening, someone who had overcome all obstacles and proven his worth. The extras and actors, used to a variety of performances, now saw him not just as a novice, but as an equal, someone who deserved to be on stage. Great job, kid. Brian suddenly appeared in the frame. I knew you had it in you. Andrew smiled modestly at him. You shut that old witch up, now that's a show. Our new hero, folks. The boy, who had once carried a backpack to school and dreamed of being heard, was now featured on the show. It was a unique event that turned his life around. He had become the youngest host in the history of the show and the channel, a title that opened doors that had seemed permanently closed. His success wasn't a fluke, it was the result of hard work, self-belief, and the chance fate had given him. Ten years later, Norman's life had settled into a more peaceful and measured rhythm. The time that had once felt so turbulent and full of worry now flowed smoothly, bringing with it new joys and opportunities for reflection. On this sunny day, he was strolling through the park, enjoying a quiet moment of happiness. His hand firmly held his granddaughter's tiny hand, who joyfully walked beside him, constantly jumping over imaginary puddles and pebbles. The girl, with her bright mind and lively curiosity about the world, looked around with wide, amazed eyes. Every tree, every flower, every bird thrilled her, and her grandfather listened with pleasure to her endless questions. He no longer rushed as he once did, no longer chased time. Now, he savored every moment spent with his granddaughter, feeling that life had taken on new meaning through their simple, yet important walks. His elder son, once the pride and hope of the family, had fully met his father's expectations. Not only did he continue the family business, but he also achieved significant success, becoming the city's top dentist, just like his father once had. The man watched proudly as his son confidently navigated life, combining professionalism with care for his family. He knew he had left the business in capable hands. The man still worked, but no longer with the same intensity as before. Now, he took significantly fewer shifts at the clinic, preferring to spend more time with family and personal interests. He enjoyed the rare but pleasant work days when he could share his experience with younger colleagues, but he primarily focused on family and his new roles as a grandfather and mentor. The family, once thought solid, always carried one lingering pain, the memory of the younger son, who was rarely mentioned. The parents had done everything to ensure the best future for him, believing that their chosen path was the right one. They spent money on tutors and activities, hoping for success. But their son, avoiding the imposed path, preferred entertainment to study. 
This led to constant conflicts and widened the gap between him and the family. The father, who had tried so hard to control the situation, eventually lost his patience. He was convinced that strictness and severity were the only ways to get his son back on the right path. But now, with the perspective of years and accumulated experience, he began to realize that he had been too harsh and uncompromising. In his heart, a bitter feeling of regret had taken root, the realization that Andrew was still his son. Attempts to reach his son had been fruitless. Every call ended with voicemail, and every message went unanswered. Norman knew that his son was living his own life somewhere, but what that life was like was unknown to him. He didn't stay in touch, didn't attend family gatherings and holidays, and didn't even send postcards. It was his silent but loud statement, he had detached from the family and gone his own way, whatever that might be. Grandpa, let's go. All right, sweetie, all right, Norman laughed, spare my old bones, I can't run like that anymore. Norman and Emily continued their leisurely walk in the park, enjoying the warm day. The little girl, curiously looking at everything around, suddenly tugged at her grandfather's hand as her attention was drawn to a bright newspaper stand nearby. She excitedly pointed at the display, where colorful children's magazines and a few comic books were showcased. One of them especially caught her interest, the cover was adorned with vibrant characters, and the girl immediately asked her grandfather to buy it for her. Grandpa, can I have this magazine? Norman smiled warmly, unable to resist his granddaughter's charm. Sure. Just don't tell your mom, all right? The man, with a tender smile on his face, started reaching into his pocket for his wallet. Emily jumped with joy, looking forward to the moment she could admire the pictures and listen to the stories her grandfather would tell her. As he got closer to the stand and began selecting a magazine for his granddaughter, his gaze involuntarily fell on another shelf. There lay a magazine featuring an interview with a showman. This was an ordinary situation for many, but not for Norman. Being far removed from the world of entertainment and show business, he rarely paid attention to such publications. Television shows, interviews, and everything related to the entertainment industry had never interested him. But this time, something in the magazine made him stop. His gaze lingered on the face of the person on the cover. It was the face of a young man, confident and cheerful, with that spark in his eyes that Norman had once known so well. Something about this face seemed painfully familiar, but he couldn't immediately place what it was. A thought flashed through his mind that it might just be a coincidence, given how many years had passed since he last saw his younger son. However, when his eyes scanned the name printed below the photo, Norman's heart suddenly started to race. The name was so familiar that there was no doubt this was his younger son, the one he had tried to raise by his own rules but who had chosen his own path. It was Andrew's face, the dream of whom he had never believed in, thinking it empty and unworthy of attention. Oh, my God, Norman covered his mouth with his hand. For a moment, the man was overcome with a slight tremor. He held the magazine in his hands and couldn't believe his eyes. It seemed to him that this was just a dream, that he would soon wake up and be back in his ordinary life where his younger son was seldom thought of. But reality was different. The son he once thought was lost to the world was now staring back at him on the magazine cover as a successful showman, someone who had achieved what he had dreamed of since childhood. The man stood at the kiosk, holding the magazine with his son's face, unsure of what to do next. His granddaughter, noticing that her grandfather had suddenly frozen, looked at him with surprise. She didn't understand what was happening, but her trusting eyes, full of childish bewilderment, seemed to pull him back to reality. Norman sighed quietly, looked down at his granddaughter, and once again felt that familiar tremor inside. He carefully picked up the magazine from the display as if it were a fragile, easily breakable object and brought it closer to examine it. The headline, written in large letters, immediately caught his eye. From family outcast to national favorite, why it's important to forgive your parents. These words seemed to pierce his heart. He felt the same tremor he had experienced when he first realized that the successful young man on the cover was his son. But the headline struck him even deeper. 
Forgiving parents, these words echoed in his mind, stirring up a storm of emotions. Could it be that his son, despite everything that had happened between them, had found the strength to forgive him, his father? The man, who had always prided himself on his steadfastness and principles, now stood before the kiosk, feeling his eyes fill with tears. He couldn't stop himself. Curiosity mixed with guilt compelled him to open the magazine and read the interview. I've always been something of a family fool, the interview, speaking from Andrew's perspective, read. Always laughing, never wanting to study. I wasn't like my brother. And for that, I got it seriously from my father. No, he never raised a hand to me. It was just, just that we had a hard time getting along. He wanted me to get a decent job, to be like his older son. He didn't want to understand me, and that's the worst thing a child can feel. Andrew, my boy, what have you? He continued reading. With every line, the pain his son had endured gradually consumed Norman as well. Then my first serious show was a major flop. It was a disaster. The story was very ugly, they just set me up. Father knew nothing about it, and I didn't want to explain. I was kicked out of the house, that's it. Just finished school, and I was already useless. Lived with a friend. Sometimes talked to mom and my brother. They tried to support me, but my father's word was law. And my brother, well, we even see each other sometimes. Yes, Elliot hasn't forgotten about me. Noticing Emily's worried look, Norman quickly collected his thoughts. Only now, as he tore his gaze away from the magazine, did he feel the tears on his face. Grandpa, why are you crying? He crouched down beside her to be at eye level and tried to soften his expression. He needed to find words that would explain everything in a way that wouldn't frighten the little girl. Wiping away the tears from his face, he gave a gentle smile and said, Don't worry, sweetheart. Grandpa isn't sad. I'm just very happy for your uncle. His voice trembled, but he tried to sound as confident as possible. He's achieved so much, and it's really, really good news. Although Emily didn't fully grasp what had happened, she calmed down seeing her grandfather smile. She nodded and hugged him again, pressing close to his warm body. Norman felt his heart constrict with both tenderness and pain. This moment reminded him of the importance of family, of how precious these connections were, which he now understood should never be severed. When they got home, Norman and his wife faced a difficult conversation. He showed her the magazine, handing it to her as if passing on a part of his pain and realization. The woman stared at the photograph of their younger son, at his face which seemed both distant and foreign, yet familiar. Tears also welled up in her eyes, but she tried to maintain her composure. She felt the same pain as her husband, but also regret for the decisions made long ago. Betty? Norman's voice faltered. Just tell me. I thought it would be best for everyone, she said quietly, trying to stay calm. I saw how you couldn't accept who our son was. And I couldn't bear the thought of every conversation between you ending in arguments and hurt. I knew how much it pained you, how you wanted him to follow in your footsteps, but he was different. And I thought, if you couldn't accept him for who he was, then the best solution was to just limit your contact. More precisely, to cut it off entirely. Her voice trembled, but she continued, knowing that after everything, hiding the truth was pointless. The boys were never very close, but I tried to make sure they saw each other at least occasionally. Of course, not in your presence and, especially, not in our granddaughter's presence. Children her age are very talkative, and I was afraid she might accidentally say something you weren't ready to hear. I didn't want to have that lie between us, but I thought it would be better. For everyone. Norman listened to her in silence, feeling his heart tighten with bitterness. He understood that her actions were driven by love and concern for the family, but it did not ease the pain of realizing that they had lived in different worlds all these years. They had lost so much time, so many opportunities to be together, to support each other, but instead, they found themselves on opposite sides of barricades built from misunderstanding and fear. Am I a monster? Norman whispered, unable to hide his sorrow. He was so alone, Betty. He was so scared. 
As he struggled to sit down on the sofa, Betty joined him. She had been watching her husband wrestle with his emotions, seeing him struggle with the weight of what had been revealed. Her heart ached with pity and love for him, but she didn't know how to help, how to find the words that would bring him peace. She didn't try to speak, nor did she attempt to comfort him with words that might seem empty or misplaced. Instead, she simply leaned in and rested her head on his shoulder, touching him as gently as if she were afraid to break him. Her gesture was simple but filled with deep understanding and love. She knew that at this moment, it was crucial for him to feel that he was not alone. Calming down, Norman sat in silence, feeling the storm of emotions gradually subside. The thoughts that had been swirling in his mind began to come together into a clearer picture. Inside him were conflicting feelings, fear, guilt, but also a desire to make things right, to restore what had been lost. He suddenly realized that more than anything, he wanted to see his son again. Gathering his courage, he looked up at his wife and, almost whispering as if afraid of the answer, asked, Do you think you will want to see me? Norman's eyes, red from tears, were full of hope. Will you ask him, Betty? The woman looked at her husband with both surprise and concern. She understood how important this question was to him, but also knew that this meeting might be difficult for their son. Nevertheless, she promised to talk to their son and find out if he was ready for such a meeting. Deep down, she hoped that the passage of time had softened old grievances and that their son would be willing to take this step. And so, the day arrived. Andrew, nervously standing at the threshold of the house from which he had been expelled ten years ago, took in the unchanged surroundings, the same walls, windows, familiar scent. Gathering his thoughts, he hesitantly pressed the doorbell. Moments passed, and in the silence, the creak of the door handle was heard. The door slowly opened, and his father appeared in the doorway. He was no longer young, Gray had dusted his temples, and deep wrinkles marked the corners of his eyes and forehead. But despite the signs of age, he remained the same man that the showman remembered, stern, composed, always confident. Yet at that moment, all outward signs of sternness and coldness vanished. Seeing his son, now standing at the door as an adult, the father could no longer hold back. He rushed forward, enveloping him in a tight embrace, and, as if forgetting his pride and stubbornness, shook with sobs. These were tears he had held back for many years, tears of regret, pain, and a plea for forgiveness. Andy, my boy, my dear boy, he wept, burying his face in his son's shoulder. I was a fool, son. I'm just an old fool, forgive me, for heaven's sake. The showman stood still, feeling his entire being filled with warmth and humility. In that moment, he realized that all the successes and achievements he had been so proud of paled in comparison to this simple, yet profoundly significant moment. He was home again. The home he had lost was now becoming his once more, and this reunion with his father was what allowed him to feel truly whole. Dear viewers, if you enjoyed the story, please support the video by liking it and leaving a comment. Thank you very much.